We're in Romans chapter 9 today. Romans chapter number 9, we're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of Romans. Now again, we, we do have visitors today, and, and there's always someone who's going to listen either to the audio or to the video that we post online at NorCal Grace, uh, YouTube or NorCal Grace and NorCalGrace.com, the, the, the website, who this might be their first time seeing a, a message from our ministry. And what I want to do is just a little reminder about the place and purpose of the book of Romans, yea, all 13 letters of the Apostle Paul. When you read your Bible, when you study your Bible, the Bible is a big book of 66 smaller books, but God has designed it in such a way you can't understand it. Most people don't understand the Bible. Most people are confused when it comes to the Bible. Well, this chart right behind me, as you can see, and we put this on the website as well, a 22-minute uh, just examining of this chart. It's a tool to help you understand the Bible. What we have is the nation of Israel all the way back here, going through their father, Abram the Hebrew, and then all the way back to Adam. This blue line at the bottom here represents the rest of the nations. Israel was a nation chosen by God. He's going to use that one nation as an example to other nations of what it is to have God as your, the Lord as your God. Well, what happened? Israel rejected the Son of God, their Messiah, the Lord Jesus. We're going to see that today. And, and through that cruel and criminal Roman cross, they rejected their Messiah. He rose from the dead. He sent out the, the Spirit of God in the book of Acts to give them a second opportunity through Peter and the eleven and some other disciples later. But at the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, God set Israel aside. That's what Paul is about to explain in Romans 9, 10, and 11. We're going to see that. Now what God is doing today and where you and I fit in is the dispensation of grace. We live under God's grace. Israel was under God's law, a performance-based acceptance. We live under God's grace, which is a faith-based, free gift acceptance based upon what Jesus did on the cross. Once God is done with, with us, when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, we're going to see that in Romans 11. We're going to be raptured out of here, resurrected out of here to the heavenly places. That's what we're created for, the body. God will begin again with the Hebrew people. That's what the books of Hebrews to Revelation. So if you look at your Bible, you have Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament, 39 books. What they call the New Testament, but still on the Old Testament ground, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have the transitional book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the actions, activities of the Apostles, yea, the Spirit of God through the Apostles. And then in that book of Acts, you have the fall of Israel, Acts 7, the diminishing of Israel, Acts 8 through 28, those 21 chapters, interesting enough. And then the 13 letters of Paul come into effect. Right after that, you have Romans. That's where we end. As the Lord tarries, we're going to study all the way through Romans through Philemon each and every Sunday. Now, God will take you back to the Old Testament, okay? So don't worry. You don't have to go back and read Genesis. What God is going to do through Paul is when he wants you to go back and study the Old Testament passages, Paul will take you there. We'll do that. But then, once God is done with us, the, the, the 13 letters of Paul, notice the next book of your Bible is Hebrews, and then the Revelation. Now, if you want to understand that information, we're studying Hebrews on Wednesday nights at 7. You can be with us. Once we're done there, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go right into the book of James so we can understand the prophetic program. But for you and me today, the books of Romans through Philemon, those books written by Paul, that's our doctrine. Let's look at Romans chapter number 9. We've worked, we've worked our way. We worked our way all the way through to the book of Romans chapter 9. Now, the book of Romans has one purpose, and that is to explain God's righteousness. Romans 3, 26, Paul says that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth on Jesus. The entire book of Romans, all 16 chapters, teach about God's righteousness. How can a holy God accept sinful man? Well, because God is holy, he wants you to be holy. Mankind has to be perfect in order to be in the presence of God, but no one's perfect. So what happened? God himself came and did for man what man cannot do for himself. God came down in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a perfect man and God. He died on the cross so that he could pay for our sins and give us his righteousness. The whole issue with God is a righteousness. And God's righteousness, his justice. And you know that old saying, no justice, no peace. God has to have justice so that we can have peace with God. But it's going to be through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no justice without judgment. Mankind's a sinner. You see this blue line go all the way back to Adam? Adam, our, our federal head, our father Adam, he sinned against God. And every person born in this world is a sinner. 
And so one person had to come without that sin nature given through the father. He was conceived not by a man, but by the Holy Ghost. He was sinless. He was a sinless human being as well as God. And he lived perfectly under that righteous law, never broke the law, never sinned against the father. And he died in our place as a sacrifice. And so the justif- justification, the judgment came in and through Christ. God judged his own son for you and me. And when we trust him today, we get his righteousness. Okay? The issue is righteousness, perfection. Now, Romans 1 through 5, God dealt with, through Paul, Romans 1 through 5, when you're reading, that has to do with the justification, the righteousness of God. He was righteous to condemn the Gentiles back here. He was also righteous to condemn his own nation of Israel. We're going to see that in chapter 9 today. And now through the cross of Christ, if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you can have God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6 through 8, we, we saw that our identification is in Christ. We were dead with Christ. He died, we died, Romans 6. He was buried, we were buried. He was raised from the dead, we rose from the dead, newness of life. We know that we're dead to sin, Romans 6, dead to the law, Romans 8, excuse me, 7, and dead, and have a new operating principle called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Ultimately, that's the grace of God. We now walk not by law, performance, but by grace, the free gift. Now here in Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're going to look at Israel's history. Their past history, their present history, and even their future history. It's all written down in Scripture. Look with me in Romans 9. We're in verse number 6, so let's uh, read a verse and have a word of prayer again. Verse number 6, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your word. Give us that wonderful insight and understanding, Father, and that wonderful uh, appreciation of your son as we read these verses. Just want to give you thanks and praise again. In Christ's name, amen. Notice that when Paul says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, God made a promise to the people of Israel in Scripture. Before you come to the Romans who are the Gentiles, the Romans. God had a history with one people, the nation of Israel. They were nigh to God. The Gentiles were far from God. All of these men, Stephen, Peter, our Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, David, Moses, all of those men are Israelis, are are of the seed of the children of Israel. But even before the children of Israel came to be through Jacob, we, uh, we, we see that God was dealing with the Hebrew people. Jacob's father, Isaac, Isaac's father, Abraham, okay? And so God separated the Hebrew people. That's why when we're done, he's done with us, he's going to go back to the Hebrew people. That's Abraham's physical seed, but we're not there yet. And God goes all the way back with these people, but he promised them a kingdom. He says, I will give you and your seed a kingdom, and through you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What happened to the kingdom? Why did God give the kingdom? Well, Look what happened. We're going to find out that Israel, in their unbelief, they first crucified the Son of God. And even after giving them a renewed opportunity to receive their kingdom, they didn't want it. And God changed the program to grace with us Gentiles. I'll show you that in a moment. Look at verse number six. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Did you know everyone who was part of that nation wasn't truly part of that nation? Just being an Israeli by nationality, a national Israeli, didn't make you a true prince of God. When we go back in Genesis, you can check it out yourself. When God changed Jacob's name to Israel, it means as a prince with God. Well, not all the people of Israel will serve God in that capacity. The only ones who are going to serve God in that capacity in this kingdom out here in the future will be the believers in Israel. Now go with me to John chapter 8. We saw that with the Lord. Go all the way to John chapter 8, if you will. Go to the Gospel of John. You have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the, uh, that's sort of, that they have a line in this thing. John chapter number 8. Speaking of John. We're going to John chapter 8. Good time, right? Uh, John, John, uh, I was about to say Jonathan chapter 8, but I guess you could, you know, that's the New Testament way of saying Jonathan. 
The book of John chapter 8. Now, in this context, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to the religious leaders of Israel. And he is condemning them for their unbelief in him as their Messiah. And and, and there's this con- conflict about who is truly the seed of Abraham. Abraham represents the, pro- the promise of uh, the kingdom, okay? Well, watch what happens here. Look at John chapter number 8. And there's so much, so much here, but... Look at verse number uh, 33. Let's, let's start there. John 8, 33. Hi, Maria. John 8. We're in uh, John chapter 8 and verse number 33. He's talking to the religious leaders. He says, John 8, 33. They answered him, they answered him we be Abraham's what? Seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? That's the famous passage where he says, he says, uh, if, if, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now what's interesting, these religious leaders are claiming that they're Abraham's seed and never been in bondage. But at the time, who were they under bondage of? The Romans. <laughs> because of their not keeping the law in time past, one of the, 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 the courses of judgment on Israel is that instead of being the head of the nations, as God created them to be, They were now going to be under Gentile bondage. At the time that they were saying that, the Romans, a bunch of Gentile heathens, were over Israel, were the authority in Israel, the Roman government, Caesar and and so forth. They had Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor, right there in in, in the area of Judea. So they were under bondage. They were delusional. They were right there talking about we're not under bondage, but they truly were. Well, notice what he says, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. That's what he was talking about. The physical bondage that Israel was under the Roman Empire was actually a type and shadow of their spiritual bondage in sinfulness. Verse 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. There's his, 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 him being the, the son of God. If the son therefore shall make you free, verse 36, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed. So he recognized that they were physically the seed of Abraham, just like he was. He, they, were, they were Hebrews. Verse 37, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. See, he says, yeah, you guys are Abraham's physical seed, but you don't walk like your father Abraham. He's a believer. You guys are unbelievers. So not everyone who was part of the nation of Israel, those he, that Hebrew people, were really truly the people of God, okay? And that's what I want you to see. Go down to verse number uh, 38. John 8, 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, Jesus said, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now who's their father? Watch this. Verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children... He would do the works of Abraham. Again, they were physically the seed of Abraham, but they didn't walk in the same steps of faith. And in their day, the faith was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They didn't. Had Abraham, Ryan and I, we talk all the time. We talk about people say, I wish I lived in biblical times. We go, you do. (laughs) I know what they mean. They wish they were back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John while the Lord was walking on earth and been part of his ministry or back there in the days of David and Moses and Abraham. But but can I tell you something? You do live in biblical times. You think God cares any less about us right now today as people in Christ and this dispensation of grace than he did with anybody? We are the people of God, the body of Christ. We live in biblical times. The dispensation of grace where we live today is in the Bible. (laughs) It's what God is operating right now. Once God is done with this dispensation and us, we go to heaven. He will begin again with the prophetic program, and then those will be the people of God in the earth out there, the little flock of of Israel. My point is, you do live in biblical times. Well, can I tell you something? Look here. He says, verse number 39, Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Verse 40, but now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love who? Me. Hey, if you and I today, who are grace believers, believers in Christ, 
If we were living back there, the same heart should apply and would apply. We would be the followers of Jesus Christ back then. If we lived during the time of David, we'd be right under his ministry there as our king, serving him and serving the Lord. Same with Moses, the people of Israel came out there. We'd be with, with Moses and Joshua and Caleb, all those believers. If you and I were out here in the future, Jews out here in the future, we'd be part of that little flock. The heart is the issue with God. Where you at in the in your generation doesn't matter. The heart of faith matters. So you are in biblical times. You are just like anybody else who believed God's word to them. Abraham believed what God told him. Moses, what God told him. David, what God told him. John, the Lord, Peter, all of them believed what God told them. The only thing that changes is the message. Today, the message of God is different. It's about God's grace, and we need to believe what God says through Paul, the grace of God. But it's the same. We have the same heart as Abraham had. That's what Paul says in Romans 4. <coughs> heart of faith. All right, here, here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 44. Ye are of your father, the what? See, spiritually speaking, their father was the devil. Watch this. And the lust of your father ye will do. What was that? Well, they wanted to kill the Lord. He was a murderer from the beginning. And the bold not in the what? The truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Again, I want you to see that just because they were part of the nation of Israel, go back to, go back to Romans chapter 9. That's the point Paul is making. The Jew says, well, where is our kingdom? Paul, if, if God is doing this new program, he, he promised all of our fathers, going way back to Abraham, that he would give us an earthly kingdom. Where is it? Where is the earthly kingdom? Oh, yes. You, you, no problem. No problem. Come on. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What we're going to see is that Paul's going to say that there's an Israel of God. In fact, he uses that term in Galatians 6. He talks about the Israel of God. As that turns out to be during the dispensation of grace in the beginning. There's no Israel of God today. Uh, when Paul was, was commissioned, God had just come off of this prophetic program. There was still a little flock of belie Jewish believers left on the earth. Now, they all have died out. God is going to resurrect a new little flock when he's done with our dispensation of grace. But during the time Paul writes, writes his early epistles, uh, particularly first, uh, first and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians, there are a mix of the little flock and the body of Christ. They had not died off yet, okay? Now, today, there's no little flock. Any Jew or Gentile saved today is part of the body. But you have to distinguish that in Paul's epistles. Now, notice here... There is a, there's, we're going to see there's a believing remnant. There's a believing remnant of Jews who were in that old program before Paul, the little flock. But after Paul has saved any Jews who believed on Jesus, they went into the body of Christ, okay? And that's been the program ever since. Now, once God is, the fullness of the Gentiles become in, the body of Christ is complete. He were raptured out of here, go to the heavens. God is going to resurrect, you see down here. He's going to bring a believing remnant of Jews back up to him. It's going to be the new little flock. We'll talk about that later. But notice here, verse number 6 and 7, Romans 9. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. It wasn't God's fault they didn't get the kingdom. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they children. We just saw that. Remember what the Lord said in John 8? You're Abraham's seed, but if you're not Abraham's children... You don't have the faith of your father, of our father, Abraham. He's your physical father, but your spiritual father is the devil. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Just because you're part of Abraham doesn't make, make you the seed. Now, he's going to go back to Genesis in a moment. Watch this. Look at verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in who? Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, many of you already know this. We went through it. Abraham had two sons, right? Anybody remember the first, the name of his first son? Ishmael. Ishmael. Did he have that with Sarah? Did he have him with Sarah or the Hagar? Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid. That's not the promised child. His first son was of the flesh. That's Ishmael with Hagar. 
But then God made a promise and he fulfilled it. Abraham and Sarah, his wife, had a son. His name was what? Isaac. That was the promise child. Verse number eight. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, similar to Ishmael, right? These are not the children of God. So just being out of the seed line physically doesn't make you part of God's plan and purpose. Abraham had a physical seed named Ishmael. He's not the promise. Abraham later had 10 other sons through a second wife after Sarah died, Keturah. They're not the promise. One man was part of the promise, Abraham and Isaac. But Isaac has a couple of sons. Anybody remember what his, what their names were? Esau and Jacob, right? Well, Jacob and Esau, we saw them from the book of Hebrews as well. Jacob is the one who God in Genesis 32 changes his name to Israel, okay? But of the two boys there, let's look at that. Look at verse number eight. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Further explanation, verse nine. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, this is the Lord talking to Abraham in the book of Genesis, and Sarah shall have a son. Verse 10. And not only this, we're in uh, Romans uh, 9, verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebecca, now who is Rebecca? Well, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, right? Mm -hmm. So God, watch what he's doing. He makes the promise. What, what Paul is doing is he's trying to show the history of Israel. Abraham had a son. It wasn't Ish Ishmael, it was Isaac. But in order for Isaac to have children, he had to get married. And so God provided a woman named Rebecca as his wife. And so the same way God made promise to Abraham and Sarah, he makes a promise to Abraham and Sarah's son, Isaac, through and Rebecca, his wife, that they're going to have a seed that's going to come as part of the seed line. But end, they end up having twins. Let me show you something. Verse number uh, 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Now watch what he says in verse 11. You see, there's a parenthesis there. And Paul is going to explain that there were two little boys in that womb. Neither one of them had even been born yet, didn't do any good and evil. And God chose one of them. Now, we now know through history, looking at the boys in Genesis that God, as he always does, makes the wise choice. Because God, who knows the future, he knew the hearts of those boys, and he knew that a, that that um, Esau would be the one who sells his birthright. He doesn't appreciate the promise. And then Jacob would be the, the one who has the heart to believe God. But before God, before that worked out in history, God chose something about them while they're still in the womb. Watch this. Look at verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. So that's two things. So they weren't born yet, nor were they even of the age of accountability before Almighty God. They weren't held responsible, okay? Before any of that, God made a choice. Verse number 11. That the purpose of God according to what? Election might stand. Now, election is a confusing doctrine amongst Christian Christendom because people make it confusion. We just held an election last November. We, we, we chose president, vice president, all these different offices to serve the people. Election in the Bible simply means service, just like you, you, when you elect a, a representative to serve the people. That's what they should do. Our, our politicians serve themselves most of the time, right? But... The point of, of, of electing a, 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 a servant, a, 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 you know, a, a government official, is to serve the people. Well, here, God elects a, a person and some people out of that person to serve him. That's what he's talking about. Watch this. Verse 11. For the children being not yet born, speaking of Esau and Jacob, neither having done any good or evil. Here's the purpose. That the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Look at those next three words. Not of what? That's very Pauline, not of works. When Paul talks about how you're saved today, by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how we're saved today in the dispensation of grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Well, God does that throughout history. 
He makes a sovereign. You hear that word sovereign. That means he just chose based upon his own wisdom to do it this way. And that's the way it is. He's God. Watch this. Verse number 11. That the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God did the choosing. It was said unto her. Now watch this. Look at what God said to Rebecca. The elder shall what? Serve the younger. Now let me just put this out there since people listen to this all over. There's a doctrine called Calvinism where it says, well, God, before the world began, chose some to salvation and some to be lost. That's not the God of the Bible. That's a false God. The God of the Bible desires all men to be saved and come into knowledge of truth. He desires that all men come to repentance, as Peter says in prophecy, and that none be lost, or none, that none are, 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 are lost. God, if it was up to God, every human being ever born into this world would be saved. But it's not up to him alone. The human being has to make the choice of faith. And some people choose not to believe God's saving message of Jesus Christ, and then they lost for all eternity. Well, notice it didn't say saved or lost. The key word in that verse, look at verse 12 again. It is said unto her, that's Rebecca, the elder should do what? Serve the younger. So what is that? Well, they had two sons. They had twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's people becomes the nation of Israel. His brother Esau in the Bible, when you read in your Old Testament, there's a people in the Bible called the Edomites or Edom. They're the physical seed line or multiplied seed line of, of his brother Esau. They're in the Middle East as well. What's going to happen is in this earthly kingdom out here, Jacob, his people, Israel, will be the head of the nation. And the other nations will serve them. One of those nations, in close proximity, by the way, in the territory there in the Middle East, will be his brother Esau or the Edomites. The Edomites are going to serve the nation of Israel in the future. That's all he's saying. They're going to be in that kingdom serving Israel, okay? Well, look at verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I, what? Loved, and Esau have I Hate it. Love less. Yes, that's what we're going to see, Dorothy. The question comes up, wait a minute, how can God hate anyone? Doesn't the Lord Jesus says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself? Love is the fulfilling of the law, he says, Paul says. I mean, in the Bible about loving your brother, the first question asked by man to God, Cain, in his rebellion, says, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, yes, you are. Humanity is supposed to love and serve one another. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to see from some verses that when he says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, based upon God's knowing their heart and, and their, their response to him, it just means he loved one more than the other. Let me give you an example. This is a perfect example. There's a few of these. Hold your hand here. Go to Deuteronomy 21. Go all the way back to the law. Because there's a passage in the a law of Moses to Israel about this very thing. Deuteronomy chapter 21, if you will. <clears throat> now, we'll look at some other ones, but this one succinctly puts this issue of what, what it means to be loved and hated. There's another one in, in, in Genesis we'll look at, too, with uh, dealing with the, 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 uh, the, the men back there we're just looking at. Look at Deuteronomy 21, and uh, let's start for context in verse number... Yeah, maybe let's let's well, you know what, mother? Let's go down to uh, there's there's a little bit there's a lot of these, but um, start at verse fifteen for context. There it is, right there. You ready? Deuteronomy twenty one fifteen. If a man have what two wives, one beloved, and another what? Hated. Hated. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Why would a man take a wife? Of a woman that he hates. See, you see the context there? No. It, it no man is just no man's gonna hate a woman and say, ah, oh, well, okay, come on, be my wife. No, no, no. But the terminology there, let's just let's just read it and then we'll we'll break that down. Mine says unloved. Well, it's not even unloved, it's just that he prefers one over the other. Yeah. And I'm gonna show the perfect example of that from, from Israel's history with with Jacob, he had two wives. He had Leah and Rachel, right? We're going to see that. And they actually use that terminology. Jacob, he loved Leah. He just loved Rachel more. 
He had children with Leah, but he preferred, of the two, he preferred Leah over her sister. But I just want, let's finish this and we'll see that. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Uh, yeah, excuse me. What is it? Yes. Correct me if I'm, I got stuff going on. You're right. He preferred Rachel over her sister Leah. Thank you, buddy. Verse 15. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children. Again, all this was already established in Genesis. We'll see that. Both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated. Then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath. This is all about the inheritance. That he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the first. In other words, just because he prefers this woman over her, her sister or the other woman, he can't. And, and, but if the, if the one who he loved less, as it were, or preferred less, if her son was the firstborn, he couldn't switch it around. He couldn't mess around with it. He had to let her son be the firstborn. Okay? That's the point. Go back to the book of Genesis. Let's look at back in Genesis 29. Although that was written in the law of Moses for Israel, it was already established before the law of Moses back in Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 29, if you will. I just want, we're going to see what it means. God doesn't hate anyone. But based upon... Your response to his word to you, he does prefer certain people over. Look here. If you looked at the history of the world, God preferred the nation of Israel over the Gentiles because they responded to him, to his word. Okay? Obviously, they learned from their father. But the fact is, of all the nations of the earth, God preferred the nation of Israel, okay? Because of some promises he made to their believing father Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 29. And uh, start at verse 31 for context. Okay, so look, look at verse 29. And Laban, Genesis 29, 29. And Laban, so this is, this is the father of the two ladies that Jacob wed. Okay, this is Uncle Laban. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, Bilhah his handmaid, to be her maid. Okay, so this is Rachel. And he went in also unto Rachel. So Jacob is consummating the marriage to Rachel. And he loved also Rachel, now watch watch this, more than who? Leah. All right, keep that in mind. See what that verse says? Jacob of the two, you remember the story. I, I hope I don't have to go through, you can look at it. He goes and he serves his uncle Laban seven years to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. Right? What did Laban do? He pulled a switcheroo on. <laughs> he gave Leah. He sent Leah into the tent. He consummated with Leah and looked up in the morning and said, Whoa, you're not Rachel. You're Leah. And he goes to his uncle and says, well, you, I worked seven years for your daughter, Rachel. Seven and he says, He goes, Ah, come on, nephew. You know we can't do it like that. I cannot give away. The second born before the first. Well, he should have told him that seven years earlier. Mm -hmm. The reason he didn't is because he was being blessed by Jacob because the blessing of God was on Jacob. And, he, and, Laban, and Laban was being blessed through Jacob. So he says, I tell you what, you keep Leah, she's yours. I'll give you Rachel, but you got to work another seven years. In fact, let's look a little bit at that. Look at verse 21, Genesis 29, 21. This, this will answer some things about the 70th week of Daniel and things like that too. Verse number uh, 21. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go unto her. So he's asking for Rachel. Verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening that he took, not Rachel, but who? Leah, Leah his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. Okay? So they're in a tent at night, they're consummating the marriage. Verse 24. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, his maid, for handmaid. So that's going to be her assistant. That's where we get the maid of honors. You know, you know how ladies have maid of honors at their wedding? It's, it's the tradition start back there. She's had his wedding. These are her handmaids, her maid of honors. Anyway. Verse 25. And it came to pass that in the morning, because they're out in the tent in the dark, in the desert. It's dark. The light of the morning comes. This guy looks over. <laughs> now people do out there night of drinking the what am I? Y'all, y'all. What? What is this? 
that. Well, here we, this is what happened to this man. Watch this. And it came to pass. Um, oh, sorry. Look at verse number 25. It came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was who? Leah. And he said unto Laban, I can imagine he looked up. That guy put on his robe and said, let me go talk to my uncle right now. I, I know he's stormed. The guy been waiting seven years. You know the beautiful thing about it, too, when you love someone? It says that the seven years that he labored for Rachel's hand in marriage, it seems like nothing to him. Time fly. When you, that man saw that woman every day, and for that seven years it flew by. He was waiting and waiting. Well, in that way, he was, he was waiting to marry her. And what happens? He got the switcheroo from Uncle Laban. Watch this. Here we go. He, verse 25, he said unto Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Verse 26, And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Again, why didn't he tell him that seven years ago? He gave the man a choice. He had that man thinking he was going to give his, his, his daughter uh, Rachel. Deceived him. Beguiled him. What did you say? Shady. Shady, man. Shady dealings over there, man. But watch this. Okay. Jacob loved Rachel so much, he was willing to endure another seven years. <laughs> I say endure because now he's got the sister, and he's still under the father's, you know, he's in there, you know, he's, he's with the father Laban, her father Laban. He, he wanted to get rid of it. At the end of that next seven years, he's about to get out of there, okay? But the point is, he has to endure another seven years around Laban. Here we go. Verse number uh, 27. Fulfill her what? Ah, a week. Seven years. Yes, it's not seven days. In the Bible, a week, unlike in our culture where when we, if I say, hey, in one week, meet me here. You're thinking we're going to meet back here next Sunday, January 13th, which we will, Lord willing, we're here. But not in the Bible. You have, you can't just assume it's seven days. A week is seven anything in scripture. It could be seven days. It can be seven years, seven months. Yeah, seven weeks or seven years. All of them are in the law. Is it called a heptad? What, what is it called? I think it's called a heptad. Yeah, heptad. A week is seven somethings. You fill in the blank. It could be seven days. Our weeks are seven days. But in the Bible, it's days, weeks, months, and years. You know from the context. You know from the context. Notice that, notice it says in verse 27. Fulfill her week. That means seven years. And again, that's why when we talk about the seventh week of Daniel from Daniel chapter 9, verse 77. Yes. The, the 70 weeks that are determined on Daniel's people are 70 weeks of years, right? 70 weeks of, am I got that right? 70 yeah. weeks of years. Yeah, 490 years. Here, fulfill her week, look at verse 27, that's seven years. Not seven days, not seven months. Seven or weeks or it's years. Verse 27. Fulfill her week and, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven what? Other, other years. Year. If, if you want a good verse to show, I remember having this conversation about 10 years ago with a guy. And I showed him that verse. I said, look. Because he was like, how do you know Daniel's seventh week is, is your? I go, he goes, I said, in the Bible, you... A week, don't think about it from, we, we think about it from our viewpoint. No, you got to let the Bible tell you. Right in that one verse, he told you her week is seven other years. All right? There we go. Now, verse 28, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel to uh, his daughter to wife. So the guy was with him for 14 years, got both women. Now, here's the point. He has two women. He has sisters who are his wives, like Deuteronomy 21. Let's look at it. Verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel. This is the beloved one. And he loved also Rachel, what? More than Leah. Now keep that in mind. He loved Rachel more than Leah. Is that saying he didn't love Leah? It's just saying of the two, he preferred his, his affection. He loved the sister Rachel more than he did the sister Leah. That's all. And, but, but watch how Leah speaks about herself when it comes to the husband's affection. <coughs> Let's keep going. Verse number 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was what? 
hate it. Yes. Exactly. Just what, that's what it means. So I want you to see when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Verse 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. That's one of the tribes of Israel, Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord had looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And that's the point. It was a, a d- issue. But here's the point. When we look at Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, it's simply like what we see here the first time this is mentioned. One, if he loves one more than the other. Deuteronomy says you have two wives. A man ain't going to marry a woman if he, he doesn't want. He might want one over the other. Okay. All right. We'll look at one more passage about that. Let's compare it to um, in the New Testament. So-called New Testament. Here we go. Matthew 10 and Luke 14. Get Matthew 10 and Luke 14. Now, some of you all were with us. And we Matthew were... 6 has a good one, too, about the two masters. Really. Oh, sure. Well, let's do that, too. Get uh, Matthew 6 and Matthew 10. So with one hand, get Matthew 6. With the other hand, get Matthew 10. And with the other hand, get Matthew. I know, you don't have three hands, so okay. no. <laughs> One hand, get Matthew 6. The other hand, get Matthew 10. What other hand do we have? Use a toe, use a foot. Use a foot and get uh, Luke 4. Don't take your shoes off, Jonathan. No, I'm just kidding. Luke what? I'm just playing with Jonathan. Luke uh, 14. This is one Ryan and I went over the other day because we were, we were talking about how do you explain to someone? Well, when, when, when the Bible talks about, we know that God wants you to love people. God is love. He wants us to love, not hate. But when the Bible terminology is to show you, it, it, it is the strongest way to show you how much more someone is loved than the other. That's the point, okay? How one is preferred over the other. Matthew chapter six, and this is the one about the the uh, the two masters. Let me let me find that one. Verse twenty four. Twenty four. Thank you, Ryan. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. So, in the context, we just broke into the context. You see the difference there. Hate. Love, preference. There's a preference there. Hold to one and despise. And to see it, I'm going to I'm going to show two competing, uh, two two comparable passages, same same context where the Lord talks about this. And you'll see how He says it. Hate means to prefer one less than the other. Okay. Here, watch this. Get um. What did I tell you? Matthew 10. Yeah. Look at Matthew. Uh, 10, but before you do, first look at Luke 14. Look at Luke 14, verse 26. This is how we learn, you know, Bible study is just kind of going through the passages, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Alright, let's look at Luke first. Luke 14 and verse 26. Verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's a strong statement. That, that's the Lord Jesus talking to Israel. Let's go through that. If any man come to me, so you got to come to him first, believe on him as your Messiah in Israel, and you have to hate your father and mother. Let me stop right there. He got on the religious leaders of Israel for not honoring. One of the, the, the Ten Commandments was to honor thy father and thy mother. And he got on them for taking the gift, the financial gift, and say, well, it's for the temple of God. And he said, no, use it to provide for your parents. That's what he was talking about. He got on them. So obviously, Jesus doesn't want you to hate your parents. But comparatively. Comparatively, that's right. What we're going to see is your love for the Lord ought to be like you hate everybody else. Because if there's anyone else who has a hold on you that's keeping you from your, your growing in your relationship with the Lord... You put that, you make it like you hate them. Now, you don't treat them bad, but there's the comparative. Let's let's look at verse 26 again. There's father and mother and wife. All through the scriptures, God gets on Israel for not loving their wives. The book of Malachi, he says, you're, you're, you're dealing treacherously with the wife or your youth. He's condemning Israel for the men not loving their wives. Well, here he says, hate your wife. 
compared to your love for Christ. Ah, watch this. Children. Who's going to hate their children? Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The apostles were trying to keep the children from touching. He says, no, let them come. Bless them. He loves children. But your love for your own children and brothers and sister and your own life has to be such that none of the none of those worldly things keep you from your relationship with the Lord. It's a preference thing. Let's look it over in Matthew. I'm sure you guys get the point. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. So when the Bible uses the word hate, he's not saying like, you know, you hate your, you know, hate your enemy. We don't, you know, don't, no, it's, you love one or prefer more, better yet, you prefer one more than the other, okay? All right, the same, the same context, look at Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's the same comparable passage. Over there in Luke, he says, hate, if you don't hate your family, you cannot be my disciple. Here he says, if you love them more than me. So you can see that. You're to love the Lord more than you love any other human being. He wants to be first. That's the first, first by the, the, the Grand Canyon, okay? First by a long, long way. Let me tell you something. That, that never changes throughout Scripture. Today, in the dispensation of grace, the way you love the Lord Jesus Christ is you believe his word through the Apostle Paul. There, there's no other way. He is going to test your love. Well, test me now. But he's going to examine and prove your love for him at the judgment seat of Christ based upon your seriousness of his, your love for his word. You got Paul says to love his appearing. He tests your love for him. If someone said they love the Lord today, they'll love the message that he gave through the Apostle Paul. You find it in Romans 5, it's called the mystery of Christ, better known as the grace message, okay? That's how you love Christ today. And if you do that, you'll do the work of faith, you'll grow in the doctrine of, of the Apostle Paul, and then you'll let that word of Christ dwell through you and richly out from you, the outworking of it, we'll get to that part in Romans, just stay with me. You'll get the word in you, and you let it work out through you when you believe it, okay? All right, so I just want you to see what it means. God doesn't hate anybody, he just loved Jacob more than he loved Esau. And what's going to happen is his beloved Jacob, Israel, will be the head, and Esau, the Edomites, are going to be below serving the beloved Jacob, okay? All right, we got about 10 minutes. Go back to Romans 10. Go back to Romans 10. I'm already ahead of you. I'm running ahead. And my mind is running ahead. I got all right. <laughs> Must be the heat. It, it is. You got finishing the race on your mind. I know, man. I <laughs> Y'all know my my brain, especially on a Sunday morning, you got all these verses running through, so I gotta slow it down. Alright, here we go. So we're in Romans 10. We are in verse number. No, we're not in Romans 10. We're in Romans 10. <laughs> I'm not trying to rush y'all through this, okay? Here we go. Romans 9, verse 12. It is said unto her, that's Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now that's a quote from Malachi. If you want to read in Malachi chapter 1 on your own time, what God is saying, hey, I preferred you. In fact, let's look at that. Go to Malachi. We'll look at it. I said if Paul takes you back to the Old Testament, then we're going to go there. Look at Malachi chapter 1. And all God is doing, it's in the Minor Prophets back there, the last book of your, yes, right before Matthew, the last book of your quote-unquote Old Testament, Malachi. Look at chapter 1. Now, while we're here, let me just get this, just to set some people free, the bondage of religion. Finances. The religious system goes back into the Old Testament and talks about a tithe. Unfortunately, they don't teach you from the Bible what the tithe is. They don't know. First and foremost, the one thing you need to know about tithe, the tenth, that is something that God ordained in the law to the nation of Israel. Today, there, there's our offering right there. That's how we get today, by God's grace. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 8, 9, and many other passages. Today you give by God's grace. You give not grudgingly, not of necessity. 
You give cheerfully, willingly, according to has God has prospered you and your appreciation for the grace of God to give out to others. There it is right there. But when, by the way, and what they don't tell you, tithing was not money anyway in the Old Testament. It wasn't money. It wasn't money. The only time money was involved in tithing, if you were too far to take the first fruits of your, your blessings of the ground and your, in your flocks to Jerusalem, to the priest in the temple, in the storehouse, you were to sell it at your hometown, get some money, put the money in your pocket, take your journey to Jerusalem, to the temple, and go to the money changers and exchange it for a lamb or whatever. You know, that's the only, money wasn't involved at all. And also, The tithe, first and foremost, was for Israel. Let me show you something. Look at Malachi chapter 1. And I want you to see verses 1 and 2. That we're, It's in context here, so you can see it as we come down to the end. Look at Malachi 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to who? Israel. Israel. No Gentiles. We're not in the dispensation of, of God's Gentile grace out here in the future. This is time passed to Israel. Verse number two, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Who is the you? Israel. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? They say, well, God, how do you love us? Well, he says, well, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved who? Jacob. He says, look here. I loved you because you guys came from a man who had a twin brother of the two of your, of your father Jacob and your uncle Esau. I chose Jacob. Obviously, I love you because I chose you. Okay. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for who? So even in Israel, there were a priestly tribe called the Levites. He has a commandment for them, but he's still in Israel. Okay. Go over to chapter number 3. Here's the passage most people go to. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob... God. Now, in context, the man is a man in Israel. It's not Paul talking to you and me how to give God. Should you get? Paul says, yes, you should. He says, as you have abounded in everything, you should abound in this grace also. You should give with that same willing heart to get the grace message out. Okay? But it's not a forced thing. The tithe was something they were commanded by law to do. The law of Moses. You give today to the grace of message by God's grace and appreciation for what God has given us in Christ. It doesn't have to be a 10%. In fact, that, that tithe, it was up to 33% of their uh, giving, okay? But my point is, today, and it's to set people free from the religious system, the tithing has nothing to do with money in the first place. It's all about Israel in the second place. It's a temple. It's a storehouse. Let's read the verse. Watch this. Well, a man robbed God. These were men who weren't bringing their tithe to the priest of Israel. Watch this. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. I've heard preachers use this verse today. In this day and age. To condemn people out there. Because you're not giving enough. You're not tithing. You're, not giving. you're robbing God. I heard a guy say that. You're robbing God. This, he goes, this message is for you thieves out there. I heard, I heard a guy stand up and say that. I wanted to wring his neck. Because that had nothing to do with people today. That's everything to do with Israel, and it's not money anyway. But anyway, let's not bog ourselves down with the truth of God's word, right? Verse 9, ye are cursed with the curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. nation. Who is that? The nation of Israel. Keep reading. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, the storehouse ain't your preacher's pocket. <laughs> No, the storehouse in Israel was a storehouse. The temple literally had a storehouse or house where they stored up this. It was to provide for the, the ministry, the, the priest. I mean, they were set apart unto the Lord to study and give the word and minister. So the other 11 tribes provided for the priest. Well, you guys do that. You provide for the, the they which preach the gospel should live with the gospel, Paul said. that You provide for the grace ministry. But it's, it's a different way. It's not, it's not a forced thing. It is a command of God, but it's one done by grace. But here, there was a real storehouse. Watch this. Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Here's the purpose. That there may be what? Meat in mine house. See? That has to do with food and things. 
And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The, the, the prosperity preachers, health work, they quote these verses. But why would God tell Israel, I'm open up the windows of heaven? Because under the law, he promised them that. He says, if, if you keep the law and do what I say, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. The rains will come in there due season. Your ground will bring forth this fruit. But if you don't, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, I'll make the rain to stop. Why do you think Elijah shut up the heavens for those three and a half years? The, 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 the new Elijah is going to do it out one of the two witnesses out in Revelation. I'll shut the heavens three and a half years. It won't rain. The, the ground will be like brass. They won't bring forth its fruit. Why? Because they were under the law. God doesn't, that's not how he works today, dealing with a nation and messing around with the crops. Look here, verse number 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. The devourer was the one who got to, 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 to fulfill the cursings in Israel. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all what? Nations. See, that's us. That's the Gentiles. Israel's going to be the blessed nation. The other nations shall call you what? Blessed. Blessed. For ye shall be a delight some land. What land is that? The promised land, right? Sure the land now. of come. Not now, but that's going to be in the kingdom. That's right. Particularly, saith the Lord. So my, my point is, while we're there, we got in. But when you rightly divide the word of truth, it will even save your pocketbook. Rightly dividing the word of truth will save you in every category of life. When you understand what God is doing today through the 13 letters of Paul versus what he's doing in the past. I had a brother in the Lord. He's a grace preacher now, back in Minnesota. Jim. His father is a Baptist, a Baptist preacher. He was training him up to take his faith. And I've had this happen a lot, particularly in the black full gospel Baptist church, you know, where I'm from and all that. Do you know a lot of young young men who are in ministry and their fathers, I've had them tell them, they've gone to their father and say, Father, Dad, you talk about the grace of God. You say we're saved by God's grace through faith plus nothing. That it's all about God's grace today. And, and, and I've had a number of these guys ask their fathers, if that's true, why do we, when it comes to giving, go back to the Old Testament under the law? <laughs> They asked their fathers. What did their father say? Mm-hmm. Bunch yeah. of religious nonsense. Son, just keep your mouth shut. It's all wrong way. You know, <laughs> trying to get paid. Yeah, they're trying to get paid. Yeah. But think about that question, Father. You're talking about the grace of God, and yet when it comes to collecting money, you go back to the law to tithe. This is, and I've had a number of them do that. Their fathers, you know, they're already in their religious system, so they don't change. But their sons see the difference, and they end up coming out of that system, right? And started grace, you know, been part of grace in us. We just so it, freedom. It's freedom. Grace is freedom. But freedom to serve. Is there financial needs? Yes. yes. In the grace ministry. And God will provide through the saints. But it's not a compulsion right. that if you don't, God won't bless you. He've already blessed us up front. When you do, it's a yeah. blessing. It, well, yes, it is. Joy. What did Paul say in the book of Acts? We, we got it in here. This Go to Acts chapter 20 on our way back to Romans. We're about to end, and we'll pick up Romans chapter 9 next week. Go, go to Acts chapter 20. Let me show you something. Yeah, it's a blessing. Acts chapter 20. As Paul is uh, leaving the Ephesian elders, he says it right here. He says, uh, look at verse... Uh, this is beautiful. I was going to show Ryan. We were talking about, we were talking about sanctification and how... The body of Christ corporally as a whole is sanctified. And yet amongst the sanctified to serve God, there are those who practically are sanctified because they've been growing in the truth of God's word. They're, 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 the whole the body is holy unto God, but amongst the body of Christ, there are some who have made themselves meet for the master's use right now today. Okay, The sanctified of the sanctified. Look what Paul says here in Acts chapter 20, verse number 32. And now, brethren... I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. He didn't say the word of the law. He didn't say the Beatitudes. He didn't say, you know, the uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He said the word of his grace. And what will the word of grace do? Which is able to build you up. You know that word edify? There it is. Edification. 
Sorry, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have shown you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And you know that. That's the point. So yeah, there is a blessing not to give. Well, if you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity. And God wants you to know for sure. If your religious or denominational system can't tell you for sure this moment that if and when you die, you're going right from your body to the presence of the Lord, it's not worth it. No hoping and waiting, maybe, maybe my good is going to be way my bad and so forth. No, no, no. Jesus Christ came so that you can know for sure. Before, they didn't know. They had to maybe, hopefully, I get in under the law. But when Christ died, and now how Paul preaches that cross, that Christ gives you eternal life, the, the gift of God is eternal life, and Jesus Christ, died. Lord, you can know for sure whether you have eternal life. If no one ever loved you enough to ask you that, I love you enough, these saints do, that's why we have a ministry, but... Paul says, our apostle says that God loves you enough. Romans 5, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, still in our sins, not trying to change or repent, just still in our sins, Christ did what? He died for us. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And if you trust him and him alone, what he did on the cross and that cross alone, his shed blood, his shed blood alone, God will give you eternal life as a present possession. You can know for sure. How long is eternity? Forever. Forever. And the gifts and calling of God without repentance. When he gives you the gift of eternal life, it's, he doesn't take it back. Because it, it's God's grace. And then he forgives you all your sins, obviously, past, present, and future sins. You're going to sin against them in the future. You have this flesh. doesn't mean you stay in sin. As you grow in the grace of God, there's your edification and sanctification. It's going to set you free from sin. You'll sin less. That's what stops sin. Grace, not the law. And then he has an inheritance for you. Now, your part of the inheritance is based upon your willingness to grow in the grace of God. I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you that inheritance. Okay. Well, we'll help you with that here at this assembly. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for the word of God's grace. Uh, Father, it's a wonderful thing that we can study out the Apostle Paul and Still uh, glean from your, your Old Testament plan and purpose with the nation of Israel that you will fulfill in the future. But knowing the rightly divided word that you're dealing with the body of Christ today, that's us, those of us who trust Christ as our Savior, and that you have a plan and purpose for us to be fulfilled, not only in the future in the heavenly places, but right now. But first thing you want us to do is not work, Father, but to grow and learn. Just like little children who have to learn and grow first before they can serve their father and their mother. We need to grow and learn the doctrine of grace. And so we thank you for this assembly. We thank you for uh, these uh, brothers and sisters who have come uh, to, to hear the word of God with us today in fellowship. We pray that we can continue to be uh, of service to you and to them to build them up so that they might get a full reward at the judgment seat of Christ. That's our goal, to serve you now and to please you now, but also to get our full reward to serve you and glorify your grace in the future in the heavens. We thank you for this. We're going to uh, take our uh, break and have a time of Q&A, question and answer. We ask you to bless that time as well. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.